my my background or my well my background we don't go that far but my kind of home community is actually the actual community and this is also where i wrote quite some books and where i'm known kind of as a speaker i know i'm not well known here in this community well so so um anyway what i really want to talk about today is kind of my my passion that's with me for a long time, but I always had this struggle of bridging it to my professional life. And that passion is about sustainability. I even have a, a training. Do I hear the echo as closer as I go there? There's a line which I shouldn't cross. Um, uh, and a certification as a com... I can even never say that. Uh, emission control commissioner on environmentalism. This is too difficult, actually. But this already, I, I did this as a study long ago, but I never really worked in this part, so in this field. But so this is with me for quite some time. Another thing is kind of what probably you also see in your private life. So this is from a hike that I did, and it's very close to where I live, and it shows um, what was also reported in, um, I think it was this year's forest report in Germany, where I'm based, that 80% of all trees in Germany are actually damaged. And this is what you can see here as well. So this concerns me. Another concern that I'm having, which has to do with my private life, life is that I'm a scuba diver. And as a scuba diver, my concern goes with it that um, in 2050, it's expected there's more plastic in the sea than fish. And another forecast is already in 2030 that there people think that almost all coral reefs will be damaged as well, or maybe even dead. So this is kind of where I think, well, we need to do something. And so I started, I believe in 2018, to combine what I do in my regular job, which is kind of actual stuff, and bring sustainability in there. And one of the things that um, I have done, together with some other people, also is creating something where we can actually collect data in what's going on in our lives as software developers, in our teams, and what can we do to make things better and not worse. And this is what I want to talk about. However, before I do that, and maybe we now need already the microphone, so Felix, oh, well, maybe we can start also over here. I'm handing it over to you, sorry, uh, which is, what is your connection to sustainability? Or maybe the question is, why are you here? But I have it now phrased this way, but yeah, what is your connection? Why are you here? I work in a company, we build machines for printing and we are interested in reducing the environmental load. We want to become more sustainable reduce energy consumption, reduce material waste and product waste for us and for our customer. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, if you just pass it on. Uh, I'm a software developer and I'm just in general worried about the future and if I can help in what I work in, then uh, it's nice to feel like you can help, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so similar, so I'm a software developer as well. And I think for me, uh, I believe, you know, of course, I'm concerned about the whole sustainability aspect, but I don't know enough how in my field, you know, yeah. what small steps me and my team can take to help, uh, you know, sort of prevent some of the issues or just help sort of that fight as well. You know, of course, we have big machines, we can do, you know, energy, saving energy, we can have different sort of mechanisms but also for smaller steps, you know, what mm -hmm. can we do as a team to take some small steps yes. Yes. to just reduce this, you know, wastage, so to right. say. Right, right. Um, I was, like, I'm also a developer, but I was reading a book recently about um, how the internet specifically has a huge sunken cost in energy and materials uh, that impact the environment a lot, and I'm curious how this ties to... Your Sounds like Gary McGovern. 
No, it no. was reset by, um, ah. I don't remember the name of the author, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ah. And it's also allowed to skip, by the way. Don't feel like enforced. I don't, yeah. Ah, hi, yeah, yet another software developer, um, an aging one. Um, well, my connection, I've got two things in mind at the moment. First of all, both my children live in Australia, famously the driest planet on the, con the driest continent on the planet. Um, and we're all being impacted by climate change these days, but if you live in a dry place to start with, you're going to feel it first. Uh, the second is that on my doorstep at home is currently being planned the building of what would be Europe's largest solar farm, um, which, in my opinion, is actually totally in the wrong place, but mm -hmm. we'll come back to that. You don't build... Big-scale solar farms around the rest of the world are not in places like the UK where it's cloudy and it rains all the time. Right. Um, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, uh, this is really just a, uh, a money-making grab yeah. but by the landowners. But anyway, um, and thirdly, um, having spent a lifetime in software and computing, um, I am now very worried that some aspects of computing are consuming energy and polluting the planet at an appalling rate. And mm -hmm. I would rather that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Adekunle Ujo. Um, I work with oil and, oil and gas company. Uh, actually, where, where, when I saw uh, data, I mean, sustainability based on data, uh, it, 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 it do not mean that I should be in this class because uh, I'm an IT, uh, IT person in an oil and gas environment. Mm -hmm. I want to see how we can um, explore data or data mining, you know, manipulating data in order to sustain our business. Thank you. Okay. The mic from the other side, yeah. <laughs> I'm also a software developer mm -hmm. and as I'm doing silly things in an office for eight hours a day and the world is burning around me. I sometimes think about what I could do and that's why this talk yes. caught my attention. Yes. Hey, uh, yeah, sort of similar. Um, yeah, I'm a software developer and yeah, sort of environmental stuff is something I care about and I, it's something that I uh, take steps with Personally, which may or may not have network effects or whatever, but yeah, I'm interested in what uh, things I could do um, professionally or in terms of mm -hmm. yeah, projects I could get involved with that might uh, mm -hmm. be of benefit. Hi, yeah, very similar to the others, a software developer concerned about climate change and like the gentleman Mike, I've got children as well, I'm concerned for the future. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and the... Uh, a software engineer myself, um, have three kids at home, and um, I'm thinking about the future or what we leave to them. And um, one passion is optimizing code so that it uses less energy, and the other one is doing something beyond that. So some years, I think last year, I gave a lightning talk about how we stored our um, heat pump in our mm. garden. Mm -hmm. So. Right. So this is my Wonderful. connection on this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. So um, this is great, first of all, because you are all aware already about the topic, which is actually one of the things that um, I want to focus on or am still focusing on as kind of increasing the awareness overall in IT, in software, in the agile community. And then the other thing that was kind of, I think, mainly here with, with both of you, kind of the, what came out for me, the complexity and being overwhelmed. What, could, what can I do, actually? So this is often a struggle. And then, of course, also the question, does this make a huge difference? Well, that's probably still open. Yeah, we will see. So this is kind of why I put this together, I think. And this is not only for Agile, but I said this is my background. This is why, for me, agility comes with a responsibility. But definitely, software development also comes with a responsibility. So you can really use this here also interchangeably. And um, I would just want to look at what can we do. In terms of the agenda, I 
just like that, what, so what, now what? And we are starting with the what, where we look into, well, we are already kind of welcoming setting the stage, but we are looking into um, the definition of sustainability and how it connects to our work and what maybe harm we are doing and maybe also what, what kind of help we are doing here. Then in the so, so what, I wanna connect it to actual and also kind of generate insights what's maybe already there. And then the now what is really more at, okay, what are the steps we can take and where I also would like with you to collect the data and we are looking into the data, what we generate and gather here. And which you then hopefully can also use with your team. So at least that would be my goal. That would be great if you could just take it with you and use it. So, the what. Um, yeah, first of all, to the definition of sustainability. So this is actually the very first definition of sustainability. And I heard some of you already referring to their kits. And this is basically what we have to have in mind with whatever we are doing, that we should take care that others are able to fulfill their needs as well, although they are living hundreds of years after we have left the planet. So always kind of a long-term thinking in mind, which is not so common in our world right now. It's more like the quick consumption of everything and then feeling good, but not necessarily caring for the future. And I heard this also from part of you. Now, I, I want to already kind of start here. I like that very much. That definition is great. And uh, right, the Puntland Commission was also the kind of the first report that was created by the United Nations. And this is uh, and the, the lady who's called Puntland kind of uh, was the leader there. And this is why this is called the front end definition. So I like this very much. This is how I started. Yet, I often think for my daily work, this is very broad and generic. And I'm not so sure what to do with it. And then there is this other definition from the United Nations and I can tell you already that I often feel this is too fine credular and maybe I don't know again what to do with it in my daily life. So these are the 17 sustainable development goals as defined by the United Nations. And very often, if you look at um, reports from companies, which is, I know we are in the UK right now, but in the EU, this is something that companies have to do if they, are, if they have more than 250 employees. So they have to report according not only their financials, which is what we have for a long time, but what's new is that they have to report on how they are doing on their sustainability progress. And maybe, I, I hope I'm not jumping too much here, but this is, Maybe also one of the things that drives me, because very often when I go into companies, I know they are doing this report and they have a CSO, a chief sustainability officer, and they might have a sustainability team and they are working on this report. However, when I talk to teams, they more or less everyone is rolling their eyes and saying, that has nothing to do with what I'm doing. I'm not sure what kind of report they are creating. What is it based on? Definitely not on like my personal way of product creation, which is creating software, for example. Uh, yes, um, it might be greenwashing. Well, it could also be important what they are doing. You know, it, it, sometimes it starts with, I don't know, um, reducing waste could be something or ensuring that the waste is recycled or anything, which is also great, right? Yet it's not at the core of this company's business. And so this, this is the other reason why I'm doing what I'm doing because I wanna close that gap between like what's done often kind of at the head of the company, at the top of the company, and what's really done like in the teams. Anyway, so we were at the definition. So there are these two definitions and well, maybe we, we look into some of these things. Um, 
for example, well, if I look at here zero hunger, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm super lucky that I'm living in the Western world in Germany and I have maybe often too much to eat and not too little. And so again, this is something where I think, I'm not sure what can I do with this in my life. Or even me as a scuba diver, life below water. Well, I don't know. And, and of course, you can find some connections sometimes and say, but, well, perhaps we should look, if I say life below water, and before I said that by 2050, more plastics in the sea than fish, maybe can we talk in the team how we can reduce the plastic and, I don't know, when we go for lunch or the food we are bringing or whatever, you know, so you can make a connection, but it's still kind of not real, at least for me. And so... I prefer going with a, another definition, which is uh, which has different names. It's called three pillar model. It's also called triple bottom line, um, and it has a third one which I will share once we are going through. So it always comes in threes, and actually it is derived from the sustainable development goals we just saw here. It's more or less packing some of them together and saying, oh, what are they actually standing for? And so more like a cluster of these. And now the first one, this is the one focusing on social aspects or people aspects and uh, think of uh, stuff like equity, health or livability. And let me start right here with why this connects to me more. I can see there stuff like diversity, inclusion, accessibility. This speaks to me if I think of software. It speaks to me when I think of the teams I'm working with. So this is, that's why I connect better to this definition. Then uh, the second pillar is the environment or the planet, and it's about protecting the planet. And yes, maybe, what about if we are measuring the carbon footprint of the software we are creating? Perhaps this could be something we stop doing. And um, the third pillar is the economic, and it just has been, like last fall, um, renamed into prosperity. It used uh, to say here, profit. So um, if you, you have seen that before, people have referred to that as the people planet profit model as well, next to the other names I gave you already, triple bottom line and three pillar model. And now it has been uh, renamed to prosperity because the Elkington who has created that said, like people were looking too much into making profit and not really understanding that that pillar is actually about improving the lives and prospects of everyone everywhere, which has a different meaning then, and then prosperity is probably a better fit here. So, And sustainability is actually the thing that sits in the middle and looks at all three. And sometimes we think... Sustainability is only, only in quotes, only about the environment. This is definitely, I, I would say, like kind of a, a really a big topic. However, if you look at what people, the, especially the young people, shout on Fridays, Friday for Future, most often they say something like climate justice, which goes back already to, well, maybe looking at the environment only would not be enough because that could be fixed at the cost of these other pillars. And this is not what we want. So this is why those three aspects really have to come together. Now, let's go back to software or IT. So first of all, some people think software comes to the rescue. This is one example, right? Isn't it much better if we have an ebook than a printed book? And to be honest, now we are starting going into the complexity space. It's actually not clear if this is better or not. Just so 
we all are aware of that because very often we think, oh, this is an easy solution, but maybe it's not so much so. And um, one data point that I once read was that you have to read about 19,000 19, books on an e-reader to amortize the costs of creating the e-book reader because of the material that's in there. So it's not so much the, the, the electrons showing here and you can read the book, but it's more like the reader itself. However, I, I also want to advise you be careful with this data because there are probably also other data out there. The thing is more, my point is more, it's often not so easy to have an answer here and say like, oh yeah, let's do just it this way and this is much better. Well, it might be and it might not be. Um, another thing, well, maybe not so much to the rescue, is uh, there is this forecast that has been created by some researchers, and also this is under discussion because it's very hard to make a forecast on IT here. This goes to 2030, which is pretty soon, and what it says is that by 2030, IT might consume up to 21% of the overall energy consumption. But it might also not, right? So this is a forecast into the future, and as we know it all, that can all go in different ways. We don't know. However, what it really says anyway is, well, we often think like software is light, and well, then we have the cloud, and, and so it sounds already so, so not like a carbon footprint. It comes with a carbon footprint, and definitely different aspects of, of IT come with a bigger one than other ones. Um, I want to share one more point about, well, why maybe IT doesn't come to the rescue. This is the We Man that has been created in the UK, actually um, by uh, Paul Bonomini. I think he got uh, contracted from an organization who want to show, and maybe we put this in already, who want to show kind of what kind of electronic waste are we creating during our lifetime. And so it, this man was created based on what one person in the UK over the lifetime will create in terms of electronic waste. And I, well, this is by, by chance from the UK, but of course, whatever we do in Germany isn't better. And not that you think this is worse there than it's here. However, so I got in touch with them, and unfortunately, I heard they have put it down, so you cannot really look for it. Uh, and if you are in England right now and you think, oh, let's go and see the wee man, it's not there anymore. But it has made its statement somehow. Um, now you might wonder, why do I talk about this if, well, even I had been a software developer, I wouldn't claim to be one right now, um, but we are all in software, let's put it this way, and this is clearly hardware, right? The point is, most often the e-waste is created because the software is not supported on an old hardware anymore. And this is true very much so in our whatever private life or semi-private life. If you think when you exchanged your phone the last time, probably it was, well, there were no, the apps were not available anymore, or maybe the latest OS you couldn't put on your phone anymore and, and stuff like that. Is this also a fair phone? Yes. It's exactly the same I have. I have also the green one. Very good. So how many fair phones are in the room? I know Felix. You, you, ah, cool, that's good. Um, and, and actually saying this with a fair phone, so one of the ideas is there to support the phone for a really long time with new software. So I had my last one, I just got rid of the fair phone too this year. I had it for almost seven years. I wanted to keep it for seven years, but I, I was missing two months, but it 
didn't work anymore. There was no way. Anyway, so the, my, my main point here is, and that's also true for the software we are creating for our clients, that we, I think we are not paying enough attention to make it also run on older hardware. We often just expect and say, well, why don't they then just buy new stuff? And if they complain, it's maybe too slow or whatever. And well, it's also, again, from the software perspective, our fault that something like a V-Man can be created of that size. So we might need to look more after that. Now, before we go um, maybe a little bit more in, in the different areas of these three pillars and what this could mean in terms of software, I want to invite you to look at what is your own digital carbon footprint. So we typically, I guess all of you, no matter if you have once done it or not, but you're aware that there is this thing of how you can measure your own carbon footprint, where you put in like how you live, how much space you're having, how do you heat, where, where do you travel, how much, with what kind of vehicles and so on. They hardly look into the IT. Aspect. And so this digital carbon footprint looks completely into like IT. And um, you can try this, and now I'm also happy to um, try this with you. And I, of course, did the wrong thing. I believe like this, and I duplicate my screen, and now you see this. And we can do this together if you like as well, and you tell me something. So I say like, we have here a laptop. We can already say, how many units would you like us to have here, anyone? We have one or we have more laptops. You can also think of what you are having. And perhaps I sit down. I am not hearing anything, so maybe. Okay, period of use of, of the laptop is maybe not five years, maybe it's just, can I do that? Yeah, uh, I need to write, of course. Maybe we say we have it three years only. We have perhaps, uh, I don't know, anyone a tablet as well? Anyone, well, mobile internet, we definitely have that. We have a printer there where it was the printing company. We all want to have a printer, at least one. We want to have a uh, router, perhaps, where's my, well, anyone, music streaming, video conferences. You can also say how many, how much do we do this? Oh. How many hours per day on a video conference? I'm, I say four. Um, what do I miss? Why don't I? Anyone a TV set here? Okay, and you see already that this does come with the carbon footprint, whatever we are doing. And it also um, changes the way we are working on. Why don't I see the phone, actually? I'm looking for the phone, and I don't see. Next to the top left. That was too close, too, too easy, I guess. Oops. So. We definitely use it 24 hours, period of lifetime. Often it is two and a half years. Well, let's hope for the six again, and then it's better. OK, but you, you see where we are going here. And that's an interesting aspect that you can also look at this and see what is actually your digital carbon footprint. And of course, you could also do this in your team, with your team, in your company, and look at what's there. And perhaps, OK, now I'm really blonde here. Perhaps next time, when it's your round of getting a new machine, you are saying, no, I use my old one for another year. Oh, not sure if anyone says that. 
but well, we can try. Okay. Anything um, surprising for you when you, oops. Okay. Looking at this digital carbon footprint, or is it kind of where you think, yes. Yeah, Felix. Very good that you think of that. <clears throat> yeah, surprising for me was the high consumption or the high impact on television. This is something I really didn't expect. Ah. So all the other things I could imagine, by the television I really... Yeah, that's a good point. I could have looked more into that. The thing is really, which is so convenient also, the whole streaming thing, I think I didn't even put, pull this over. That has also a huge carbon footprint which was something people talked about a bit during the pandemic, I guess. But anyway, anything else? Sorry, yeah? Just what you said. Oh, I can also repeat. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I guess more of a general question, just following yeah. up on that point, right? So for me as well, I could see TV set had a very big portion of my carbon footprint. Uh, I guess a more generic question on this, right? So now, you know, for someone, let's say, if I want to reduce my carbon footprint as well, now, you know, you see all these advertisements, you know, if, like, smarter TVs or these TVs that have less emissions, huh. right? How does that, uh, because, you know, people might make a conscious choice, okay, yes. I'm buying a TV, more expensive one, for whatever reason, less emission, but how much of a factor does that contribute to, I always wonder, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of spinning off from that. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, there, there are at least two things coming up for me here. So one thing is that what people have figured, the more efficient those tools are getting, and maybe they also have a green label, like the Fairphone, then often a rebound effect comes in that even more people are buying that, although they could still use their old stuff. And using their old stuff is always better, always better. And the other thought that comes to my mind, which is a huge difference what we are seeing with kind of what, how we live nowadays compared to, I don't know, the old days. In, in the old days, all the tools, equipments that we had, they had the biggest footprint by using. For example, if you think of a laundry machine or a fridge or kind of all those tools that we are having versus now the biggest footprint is when creating. So the production of the, the tools is the huge difference. And so this is also why, why maybe you could say the Fairphone is good because you keep it perhaps longer. However, I also know the iPhone is lasting quite long and so that, that's maybe on a, on a similar page here. Yet the thing for a phone, what people say is about 80% of the carbon footprint is in the production. So it also doesn't matter so much if you would say, okay, I. I have a solar panel and this is how I load my phone, doesn't matter. And, and perhaps the, the one thing that we always have to keep in mind, which is, you probably have heard that, this is like a, a three words that are super important, which is reduce, reuse, recycle. And it's exactly in that order. So you, we should all reduce what we are using, the next thing is, so maybe not buying this new whatever, or if we really think we need to buy it, perhaps we can manage that somebody else can still reuse our old phone for quite some time or so. And then the third thing is recycle. By the way, when I bought the new Fairphone, I was able to send in my old Fairphone, and so they, well, they also say they refurbish, but I guess there was nothing to be refurbished in this case, but they recycle the material. So this is at least something not as good as reducing or reusing. And so this is the other 
answer to that. Yes? Um, on that note, I guess uh, the problem as a consumer is, which is which ties back to as a software engineer paying attention to this, like planned obsolescence is a thing, right? You may want to keep using your own, like your old phone or your old computer, but at some point you are not able to. Exactly, exactly. I completely agree. Um, and again, my point is very often... This is not possible because of software. Very often, it's not the hardware that makes the trouble. Sometimes it is. It's not always, always. But very often, it is actually the software. Why we have to throw it away? Because, well, if I think, well, as, as you see, I'm running on, on Windows here. There's a time when Windows doesn't support that anymore, right? And I don't get any updates. And it's just too risky if I keep running the machine. So, well, maybe then I need to go to Linux or, or whatever. But the, the thing is, we are often forced to buy new hardware, of course, also because our whole economy is based on that idea. Now we are getting into a completely different topic. I don't really want to go there, but yes. Um, one, one last thing in that area, which is, well... I probably have to share this, the, the whole story there. Um, I had last year that idea thinking, oh, shouldn't we have like a, a special day where we clean up all the data that we leave as traces everywhere and so fill the whole cloud with stuff we are not using anymore? And I thought, you thought this is a cool idea and you invented something and of course it existed already. So there is a thing that's called the digital cleanup day. It has happened already this year in March 18. It is attached to the world cleanup day, which you might know where people run through the streets and are collecting waste and, and to, um, try to sort it out and ensuring that it goes into the right waste bins or whatever, like glass somewhere else than, um, than plastics or so. And so this is happening every year. And of course, you don't need to do this like every year. But uh, you have been mentioning, well, from reading the book uh, on, on like what the internet does, for example, each year the internet and its supporting systems produce more than 900 million tons of CO2. And... Well, the one thing people are often pointing to are uh, all those pictures and videos that we have uploaded and don't look at it again. And I, I'm kind of fine there. This is not what I'm doing, and it's more for privacy reasons, actually. However, I do have, I don't know, tons of Google files, spreadsheets, whatever, which I haven't accessed in years. Probably I don't know anymore what it was for. And, well, maybe this is also something we could do, starting to clean up. And, you know, the thing is, this takes, this, this has that carbon footprint because of the backups that are made and, and all of that. So it might be small at first, but it is much bigger than if you look at it in detail. Okay, maybe we kind of stay in that area a little bit, by, but now I want to dive into the three pillars again and showing what that could mean in terms of what we are doing. So this is the environmental pillar and this example. So I have example from various companies now, which doesn't mean if it's a negative example that this company is all bad and if it's a positive example that this is all good what they are doing, it's just one example. So this is from VMware, who consolidated the data center, and they found, as you can see there, that 66%, two-thirds of the host machines were actually zombies. A later research, um, no, a different research found out that this is quite typical for data centers, that there are a lot of zombies, and maybe we have that in our companies as well. Servers running, not doing much anymore. So thinking of perhaps reducing or perhaps reusing in a different way. Um, 
This is uh, from the EU a forecast of the usage of energy from data centers. And this also goes to 2030. You see there's a worst case and maybe it's, they are getting more efficient and things are getting better. Who knows? But it's just a span of what, what they projected is happening with data centers. Actually, in Germany right now, they are discussing a new law where they are saying, well, the, uh, the waste energy, is this the right term? So the heat, waste heat that comes from the data center, that this has to be reused and for heating communities. And well, this is, it has not passed yet that law, but, oh, this is, is such a great term. I think I have to say this in German because I know you all lo love so much our language where we like to put these long words. So this is the Energieeffizienzgesetz, which is also a bit hard to pronounce, I find, think. Anyway, so it hasn't passed yet. And the thing is, in Germany, I can think that this is actually working. In a lot of other countries, it will not work because the data centers are far away from any communities. And so you cannot bring the waste heat to the community. So if I think of Finland, where most of the data centers actually are, they are typically far away from anything. So, and this is different in, in my country. Okay, this is an example from um, the environmental pillar. Let's look at another one, the economic prosperity. And it is about Chef. Chef, I guess you know, is the cloud software open source. It's also a company that's called Chef and is um, uh, kind of maintaining and also, yeah, maintaining and, and contracting with clients working um, with Chef. Now, there was this story, and this comes actually last, that headline. The thing was in, I believe it was 2018, developers found out that Chef was used by ICE. ICE stands for, you see it here, Immigration and Customs Enforcement for managing the detention camps at the Mexican border. You know this, where we heard these stories where the kids were separated from the parents? Well, there's always software doing stuff like that. We often think like, these are bad people or whatever, but it's all done with software. And so that was Chef mainly involved in, in doing this and the developers um, protested like, well, we never intended that our system is used for something like that and we don't want that and we have to stop the contract. And then Chef, the company said, well, this is a long standing client for us. We had done great business with them and they pay us good money. And so nothing really happened until the point where one of the developers said, well, I am just uh, deleting all my contributions to the source code. And he did. And that created so much pressure that this headline was created. So my point here is, and maybe this is more so actually really in the actual field. In the actual field, the one thing is that we often say, well, we do everything like for the customer's competitive advantage. That's even one of the principles. And um, we, whatever changes are happening or so on, we, we want to help the client to do their business. Well, that was all true. Also customer satisfaction. Well, ICE was probably super happy with the software. Yet, we seldom look a second time what's actually been done with the software. And just in case you forgot, this is the pillar, the economic prosperity pillar, saying improving the lives of everyone everywhere. For sure, it didn't do so for the people at the Mexican border. And, and again, at least, I hardly ask that second time or take another look, and maybe we should do, should do this more often. We do have a responsibility here. Moving on to maybe a little bit lighter topic, but maybe not. Let's see, in the social part, um, 
Well, in the times before Musk took over, Twitter was always a good source for all kinds of things. And so I got this example from Twitter. So this was a system that asked for um, registration of people, and it had that rule that the last name has to be at least three characters long, and guess what? They are just people who cannot sign up. Well, this is about inclusiveness, right? And it just happens. Another example, um, which I, I believe is fixed, is this one. Those two guys had a video conversation, a conference call, and then they explored using virtual backgrounds. And guess what happened? The software just didn't detect the dark skin at the time, which is also that other example, which at least I, I saw a lot in the news where the soap dispenser didn't work for dark skins, but only for light skins, stuff like that. And I just want to be clear here. I don't believe, maybe I don't want to, but I'm 100% I'm sure actually the software team didn't do that intentional. They didn't do this on purpose. It was more probably so that maybe the team wasn't diverse enough to think that way, that this could happen in both cases. And so what I started doing now was, or is that since I learned of, of stuff like that, that when we work I'm not sure if you work with personas when you develop software, which is kind of thinking who is your target audience and then think of what kind of person could that be or group of persons could that be, that, which is a good thing because we want to really make the, the software for the target market. But then every once in a while now, since I learned that, is I suggest let's take a look at the complete opposite persona, what happens then? Are we maybe not inclusive enough? Are we excluding markets even? You can think of it from an economic perspective even, but definitely from a social perspective, are we excluding people from using the system because we narrowed it down so much into one kind of group of people? And of course, what, what in, in both cases, probably would have helped as well to have a more diverse team. So diversity also helps to create better products. Okay, so these were my examples from the different areas of the three pillar and what IT does or does not. And again, it, sometimes it's it's maybe a bad example, sometimes it's a good example, but we can learn from all of them. Now, looking at the so what, so connecting to agility, I'm, I'm, maybe I might make this a little bit quicker because I'm not sure if this is so important for you, it's more important for me maybe, which is, um, first of all, that Agile actually made a promise, so we have this two big organizations, I know you have ACCU, but and maybe there is something in ACCU and I haven't checked it out. Um, the two big organizations, they both have sustainable in their vision, mission, whatever. So Scrum Alliance says, on a mission to create agile workplaces that are joyful, prosperous, and sustainable. The other big one is the Agile Alliance says, when, when you look at kind of what do they do for their members, through the last two decades, members like you have helped make work more effective, humane, and sustainable by applying the agile mindset and methods. So there's this promise, and probably when, when the first time they came up with these sentences, probably they thought more about longevity or la long lasting in this way sustainable. The Agile Alliance has just recently changed it to this one. So they clearly know, uh, you can tell from this that the three pillars are speaking through that already. Um, but the Scrum Alliance has said probably still from the old days, but I also know that they started working on, on stuff here. 
And um, maybe one more peek into the, well, actually two, but this is the first one, into the actual alliance. So the, it, it goes on when you look into more sustainable, you can click on this and then it shows all that where it also says it's a way of working to create positive economic, social and environmental outcomes. Again, the three pillars, you can see them. So there's something happening there, and this is now the last thing. Sorry, I hope I bore, don't bore you too much with that part. Um, is that within the Agile Alliance, I have founded, and meanwhile there are more people, an initiative, an Agile Sustainability Initiative, and it is about creating the awareness of sustainability and also what can be due for creating a more sustainable future. So there's stuff going on. So this is that part. There's another part, which is um, when teams say they are agile or when a company says they are agile, then actually I think it comes with an expectation. And the expectation, does this actually work? Yeah. Um, the expectation is very much related to sustainability. For example, if a team says they are agile and then somebody finds out they are not inclusive, people would say, I thought you are agile. Or if a company says they are agile and then people find out they are not paying fairly, same thing. Or if, uh, even if you think like they are polluting their area or the water or whatever, People would say, oh, I thought you're agile. Although you could say, well, where's the connection? Well, there seems to be a connection. And so, um, let me see. So we have also worked on that by looking at the values that we have in agile and what do they mean from a sustainability effect. Like you make your, your work transparent or you look at self-organization and understand that as a company you are not like an island, but you're part of an ecosystem, you're part of the society, and therefore you have that responsibility for sustainability. Or um, constant customer focus, oh, this leads me to my, one of my favorites, that, well, the three pillars are actually playing a role, and the, the way what I'm doing there very often nowadays is whenever we talk about what we need to build, and I kind of ask, would this change if we think the planet would be our stakeholder? And sometimes it would change and sometimes it wouldn't, right? But just asking that question sometimes just triggers a different conversation. And then continuous learning, like we also need to keep learning about sustainability. So, that was my quick uh, excursion to the actual stuff. Again, this is where I'm coming from. This is why. Now, what is about kind of what, what can we do? And still, it is like two more things before we collect the data. Sustainability by Agile or by IT can mean we use what we've learned in our business and help solve the climate crisis. And this is also what's done. It's like if you think of all the water management systems, well, without software, we wouldn't go anywhere. Um, and um, an example also um, I have here from a colleague of mine, Nicole, who supported a group, a non-profit, which is called Hack Your Future. I believe this also exists in most countries in Europe now. It was founded in the Netherlands. And Hack Your, Hack Your Future is an organization that supports refugees in the way that they help them um, practice their IT software skills and show them so it's easier for them to get a job. And so what Nicole did was just supporting a team in doing so. So they, in this case, they even did something good by creating a food saver app, but that's kind of a side effect. So it was kind of helping them to do 
show their IT and software skills and this way helping them to, to find a job. So this stuff you can do. Oh, speaking of myself, so last year I had been working together with a colleague, Steve Hollier, for a um, nonprofit organization in the climate um, area. And we helped them by using kind of our actual techniques in this case, story mapping, event storming, open space to create their latest campaign. So this is stuff we can do with what we, what, what we all learned and practice. The other thing is sustainability in Agile or in IT, where we say we take sustainability as a guide for all that we are doing. For example, that we have, we, we call that the definition of done, but you could all, that measures also the carbon footprint of what we are delivering and that you are ensuring when you deliver the latest software that at least the carbon footprint didn't increase from the last time, maybe it even got better. Or another thing which also a colleague of mine has kind of created and, and wrote up, a planet as a stakeholder retrospective. So having this as an overall theme and just thinking of what would change in the way we are doing, what we are doing, can we do something maybe better? And this is it before we now start into gathering the data. So there's another QR code and I want to invite you to scan that or put that in and you will find there a couple of statements that ask you about various aspects on sustainability. And I would invite you to think of the team you are working with right now or having any kind of team in mind and try to answer it as best as you know. And then we look at the data later on. Okay, so there are various ways how we can look into this. And let me check my, my watch. That um, that we are not running out of time. And what we see right away is that the social aspect is the strongest here, so there's a fall, versus, interesting, the holistic seems to be the lowest with 2.45, environmental is also kind of low here. Economic seems to be pretty good. Maybe it also depends on yeah, which, which kind of subset I defined and asked you to fill in here. Um, I suggest we first look into like the highest and then maybe in the lowest. And let's see. And so the highest is, um, so the social aspect, and this is still, it's hard to read, but maybe if I go over. So it, this seems to be the highest thing. Is this, can you read this at all? Um, and maybe some of you remember, but now you see the statements the first time, I guess. So this one was, was four, five, seven. So five is maximum because you haven't seen that. So which uh, says the team prevents discrimination, disrespecting or targeting of team members. And the, the five would be that people say, yes, that's true. And then there are like, um, yeah, different steps in between till you go to the faults. Um, then let's look uh, into this perhaps, which is a fall. The company invests in its employees through fair compensation, individual growth, and fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's kind of a similar thing. Actually, this is something that I see quite a lot, I would say, and I believe the reason is that, well, at latest, during the pandemic with Black Lives Matter, but actually a bit earlier, that whole discussion started to get more urgency and more importance. And that's why we are where we are. Um, similarly to, let's see, is this, ah, yeah, see, this is another thing, which is not a surprise for me that it's so high, 4.17, we continuously work to prevent bad actors from ac accessing or using any stored user data, um, which is also a topic, everything around safety, security, privacy, 
probably that whole area started to get more attention, I would say like 10 years ago even. And so we made quite some progress here, which is the thing that gives me hope. Maybe the same thing will happen with the areas where we all are like, oh, I don't even know, never thought about this, and are we doing this, and so on. So the stuff is, is happening and we are progressing. And um, let's look here at the lowest one, 3.17. Oh, this was also what you were referring to with the accessibility, which also I believe so the product, product services designed to be accessible and work for people of all abilities is a topic that's only starting right now, is at least my impression, that, that this becomes more yeah, part of the overall awareness right now. Let's um, go back and go into, what, which one do you want, environmental or holistic? Well, that's so holistic is really taking the other three all together. And you could also argue from this point of view, we were not able to put this into one of the pillars only because it was so overarching over everything. So that's probably more the way we created it, that this was for us important to, to have this extra dimension. And if I now start with the lowest, which is the 1.57, oh, that's the one, the planet is one of the stakeholders, well, I talked about this a little bit. Let's go to the highest. Our sustainability actions align with our marketing, so no greenwashing, which is also good. You could probably also say we don't market anything about sustainability and that's why it aligns. So that it could also say it doesn't really mean anything. Is this how you maybe thought of it? I don't know. Um, then uh, what else we have down here? Also one which says the product service contributes to create a social, economic and environmental balance. It's also something that it says here. So, um, but the one thing that you see is that you, that we can look at the different areas and then if you think of doing this with your team, right, and, and increase the awareness and looking at what can we do to be perhaps less overwhelmed in finding our next step of what we can do. So this is the idea. You could look at this this way and see, okay, maybe we do this with the planet every once in a while and ask that question and perhaps that will help us to um, improve here. Another thing in a team, is this, uh, it's not, I think this is what I want, is it? And... Right, so these are averages. Um, also the average is what we have seen in the radar. However, what might be in a team even more interesting is what's called here the heat map, which shows well where it's really dark that well, five people said falls to, well, obviously the reporters said as one of the stakeholders. Oh, by the way, should I just pick another thing so we don't see the same statements again? And we go into the environmental, maybe. Okay, there is the very dark one. Neither false nor true. The company monitors and proactively seeks to reduce waste products. Okay, so this is somewhere in the middle. Probably it means we don't know. And however, you want to have this conversation with your team, right? If you do this, so this is this is kind of my invitation. Try that with your team, this survey, and see what information you are getting from it. And it could be, well, we, we need more transparency. We need to, to build up more knowledge about that. Or it means, well, let's do something about that. And uh, another thing that heat map shows, and this is also what I find interesting, for example, in this field, you see nobody has answered, well, let's go back to the, sorry, jumping back and forth. 
This was the average number of two, and it is the users are provided with information about how to use the product in a resource efficient manner. Isn't it interesting to do that? Never thought about that. And now it's the average was two. Remember this. Now nobody voted a three. Two answered it's more true than false. So some people seem to do that. Um, Four answered, it's false, so we are not doing this at all. We are not provide a possibility to use it in more um, resource efficient manner. There is one who said not applicable, probably also because don't know, or, or the software, it doesn't make sense to it, whatever. Um, and one answered here, the more false and true. The interesting thing, if you do this with the team, is looking just at, at the average, doesn't give you the information, where are we missing information? Because it looks like, well, we all think it's a two, but that's just the average value. And so the heat map often triggers a different kind of discussion. That's why I, I kind of like that view as well. So most often I work with those two views, the radar and then diving into um, this one, the heat map. You could also, just to give you a, a little bit further, a tour, um, and then I also see we are running out of time. It also shows kind of our key strengths where we all think this is really something that we are doing and it's uh, like 3.38 and we can also see um, statements with the highest amount of agreement so where, we, where the heat map shows more the dark fields and it's not spread all over the place because we agree on it. And similarly, you could of course think of key opportunities. So the lowest scores and then where we have the least amount of agreement. So this is just to give you an idea what else you can look at here. Um, yeah, maybe. Any questions? right now, now that you see this. And I go back to the radar, maybe. Yes, and maybe you take the mic again. Yeah, just a small question. Um, is this an, uh, a tool that everyone can use, or is this more restricted uh, mm -hmm. to you because uh, you have set, out, set it up? Mm -hmm. So, um, so first of all, it's published on the platform called Comparative Fertility. They have all kinds of assessments and whatever. It also, psychological safety, for example, is an assessment there, or how well do you do Scrum or SAFE or uh, you name it. Now, this one also published there, but it's published under Creative Commons and with the, the share alike. So you can use it, so it's for free to use. The, the setting up is a really good question because that's the thing I struggle with the most. So I, I think this is helpful for teams, at least that's what I see because I can find out what could be our next step and also maybe compare and so on. But not everyone knows how to deal with this comparative the fertility platform, so you need to have a login and then say, okay, this is my team and we are running it and you run the report. So once you have figured it out, it's not really difficult, but as often, like doing it the first time might be so. However, that frustrated me. <laughs> and so what we are doing right now is remember that I said that um, I have also founded and now we are more people this initiative under the Agile Alliance, the Agile Sustainability Initiative. And on there, we want to really provide this in a super easy way, just in a spreadsheet. You fill it in and you don't need to go on this platform and you just have any kind of spreadsheet where people fill in like we have so many truths or faults and then a report is created. Maybe it's not as fancy as this one, we don't know yet. So we. We are at the moment at a state, which is perhaps also interesting. We just uh, made a call, so people asked us, 
said, this initiative is great, what can I do? And so now we called out and said, well, if you want to do something and you are like a spreadsheet expert, here's what you can do, create that report for us. Because, well, I'm, probably I can figure it out, but I'm not. I don't see myself as a spreadsheet expert. It probably would take me much longer than somebody else. But so, so first of all, it's a yes, you can just use it. You can go there and use it and no, no problems. But it might be a bit um, yeah, difficult at first figuring out how to. However, <laughs> interesting enough, the help is really super. But who looks for help? So they really have a great tutorial and everything there, but well, people don't push that button and then they leave the platform and they are frustrated. And it seems to be different for like, it, yeah, for especially people in the, in the Scrum Alliance because they, they seem to like the platform and use it a lot. And for them, it's then easier to use just this assessment as well. Maybe they just like assessments or so, I, I don't know. But yeah, so long answer. Any any other like and, and of course I give you um, the the link. Well, you can also figure it out, but um, I also give you the link um, to to this platform right away. Um, we have ten more minutes, I believe. Any other things? Oh, first of all, maybe you want to um, take a. Picture. So, you know, very first of all, <laughs> this survey, I, actually, this is something I didn't understand. This probably will be closed at one point. I don't know. It probably has like a time period past. Nobody is clicking on it. And then it's not collecting any more data anymore. And uh, yeah, I see, I never read the help that tells me when it does so. I just know it, this happens. And um, this should be available for you for, I guess, forever. So this is where you find the report. And you can play around with the report and, and see whatever it does for you. However, we are now not a team and therefore the data is probably not so important or crucial, but it would be if we would work together in a, in a team. Um, so that's I thought I'd bring this to you. Does it work? Uh, did you just take a picture from the slide or did you use the QR, QR code right away? Just the top. Yes, it works. Okay, good. Because sometimes I forget to say it's, it's a public link and everyone can access it and just want to be sure. Aha. Uh -huh. So see, I'm happy that I didn't use that laptop because it got an update while we were speaking. <laughs> Okay, so from my point of view, I'm, I'm kind of um, closing it, but I'm happy to have any kind of discussion. So what, what I think we should do is actually change our conversations so that really we are able to increase sustainability and that we think sustainability more often with it when we create software, when we create these products, as, as hopefully you know, software has that carbon footprint and it has an impact also on like prosperity or the social aspect and we can do much more. And just the, the one idea is using that assessment for starting this conversation. Of course, you can also start it in a different way, but the assessment is kind of, I think, a, a good way with these statements for triggering that conversation. So changing the way we talk about stuff. I think that's probably where we are right now. And um, this is, well, a lot of information about me, but the thing that's maybe now I have to cross that line. I'm sorry, but important is that link. So this is like the comparative agility and under Creative Commons, that's the bit.ly link where you would go to, well, kind of the first the description where you then would need to create a, a register an account and then you, you can start working with it. But of course, you can also wait till we have the spreadsheet ready, but I no promises when this will be. But we have already some person who said, well, I can do that. So let's see. Anyway, any, any questions, comments? 
Um, I guess it's more of um, a comment than yes. anything else. But um, I think that most of the conversation over sustainability must take into account that, um, especially for the environment, um, most of what we can do must be done at a structure level. Like we as individuals, especially like even, even as software engineers, uh, we cannot do much until the drive in the industry is just making profit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like, I think that is important to point out and it's, it's a bit overwhelming. It's a bit bitter <laughs> to think about because uh, of course, I don't feel like I can do much mm -hmm. to change that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just my... Yeah, I, I agree. It, it often, yeah, the one thing, it often feels overwhelming. On the other hand, I, I kind of think we are... We are lucky to be in the EU where this is at least still a topic and where things are really changing. So they, they put out more and more laws and, and enforcing companies to do stuff. Then on the other hand, of course, also because of the war, things have come to a halt and didn't progress as much as we all would have hoped. Um, but I think really things are changing. And, and again, the 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 thing with this sustainability reports that companies are creating right now, I really believe that's a great angle where we can hook into and, and show like, okay, maybe we connected to what's happening on the team level and not only what's going on somewhere. And yeah, well, The, the question probably remains the, what I'm hearing a little bit is what I often think, the way I often think about this is, what can little me do about this huge problem? Yet on the other hand, I think now, how many people are we here? 10, 12 people? Perhaps, you know, you go out and you start and, and you create more awareness about that too. And then it's another for each of you, another maybe five or 10 people, then. So we are more and more. Felix. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to make another comment. So um, one of the, well, strategies or ways as we are taught about software development in the recent, I would say, 10, 15 years, so make small changes and then test it, do automat automation tests. So this automatically triggers uh, create a new build of the software and uh, run this on all the different hardwares and flat platforms. So the way as we are in the agile way of developing software forces us to, uh, to consume more energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are, <clears throat> at least this is in the, as in, in the companies I've worked uh, before. So um, we really got more and more uh, server capacity to run the build servers and do all this stuff uh, to come to or to, to fulfill, fulfill mm. one of the goals of the agile software development, make small incremental changes. Mm. And um, I think this is, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what's way around, uh, around this, but this is another issue which... Mm -hmm came mm -hmm. to my mind. It's the same if you uh, push something to GitHub and trigger then their GitHub actions uh, to test the software and all this stuff. So uh, I don't know how many watts, kilowatts are burned mm -hmm. just by one, one single commit. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, which is also a nice thing about the whole process of thinking about this. Always when we try to keep the software that we are creating small, performant, efficient, then it doesn't take as much energy, which I often think is kind of a win-win because it should be the idea anyway to make have a small footprint. And I'm not talking about carbon footprint right now, more like data or um, yeah, space needed and so on. And that all helps as well sustainability. And so kind of um, ensuring the build runs fast 
would be one of the things that also would reduce the energy consumption. And yes, there's probably, for most of the things, no clear answer. Uh, they, it's all interconnected. Yes. I think that does not have to be necessarily a contradiction making or being or trying to be agile and act agile and develop and uh, fast feedback loops because um, making the wrong things faster makes you wronger. And so mm. at the end of the day, uh, if you have a project that goes wrong for years, you have spent a lot of energy. And another thing I wanted to add to mention is um, there's an old um, African saying, I think it's, it's um, somehow like um, many small people that do many small steps can change the world. And I think don't, don't give up, so there's hope. I would say these are the best closing words. I cannot top that. So thank you all so much for coming and let's change the world.